Another year, another autumn. Along with the crisp air and changing leaves, pumpkin carvings and PSLs, autumn always brings about this feeling of fading brilliance, of realms unexplored, and of things unknown. Hi, hello, how are you? My name is Suchi and welcome back to my channel, where I talk about the stories that I love and that inspire me. I feel like autumn is the season with the most specific traditions, at least here in the east coast of the United States, of New Jersey, if we're being more specific. Some people pull out their favorite cardigans or a special pair of boots. They go apple picking or to Trader Joe's and buy everything pumpkin spice flavored, whether it makes sense or not. And if you're like me, you just fully lean into the fall girl aesthetic and do all of the above. But there's one other fall tradition of mine that I always make sure to do no matter what, and that is to watch Twitches. I'm just kidding. That was last year's video. I mean, it's not a lie. I still watch Twitches every October, but for the past few years, no autumn has felt complete for me personally without watching the Cartoon Network masterpiece Over the Garden Wall. It's a miniseries created by Patrick McHale and centers around two brothers lost in a mysterious forest. It came out in November 2014, so it turns 10 years old this year. And even though it's been out for like an entire decade at this point, there seems to be a timeless sort of quality to it. And if you're watching it for the first time, you can't quite place where or when this story occurs, at least not until the end. But even then, not every question is answered, not every loose thread is tied, and not all doors are shut. Like all the great mysteries of the world, some things are still left up to your own interpretation. The tale of children lost in a wood is a constant theme in many fairy tales, and that's part of the appeal of this show. The premise seems familiar because we've all been there before. Whether you read about it in Hansel and Gretel, or if you literally got lost somewhere because you stray too far from your parents, that feeling of being unmoored in a strange place is something everyone experiences at some point in their lives. This, along with the intensely autumnal world that these brothers are lost in, makes Over the Garden Wall the essential October viewing. Even if you live in Australia and the cherry blossoms are blooming, it doesn't matter. The vibe is so immaculate that no matter where you live, you'll be transported instantly to the east coast of the United States of Americana. So in honor of Over the Garden Wall's 10th birthday, I'm going to talk about why an animated show about two brothers lost in a forest lives rent-free in my brain. The brothers are named Wirt and Greg, and the elder brother Wirt is voiced by the illustrious Elijah Wood, who, by the way, was a great choice for this character in particular because his voice is just the perfect mix of slightly nasally and deadpan here. No, 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 no. Magic talking birds leading us to fairy godmothers in the mysterious... I'm going to Pottsfield. Which really helps sell Wirt as a sullen teenage boy who is also prone to anxiety and overthinking everything. He's just like me, for real. Greg is Wirt's younger half-brother, and he is a sweet little bean who carries around candy in his infinitely large pockets and kindly distributes them to the masses. I say infinitely large pockets because the amount of candy this child tosses out is bigger than the universe. Greg is who I aspire to be when I grow up, just full of whimsy and kindness and has a pet frog that he picked up from somewhere. He's unbothered, he's flourishing, even as he's lost in the woods, and he might not exactly be with it all the time, but honestly, who among us is? Anyway, my point is that Greg is the original cinnamon roll, someone pure and good who always comes through in the end. The dynamic between these brothers is evident from the very first episode, because while Wirt realizes they are lost and subsequently has a nervous breakdown, Greg is just out there vibing. He's just happy to be there with his big brother and his frog, who he hasn't quite figured out what to name yet. At this point, all we know is that Wirt and Greg are lost in a place called the Unknown, and it's autumn. We don't know how they got there or where they're going, and neither do they. But we quickly find out that this is not your average leaf peeping destination. A demonic creature chases them around, but ends up being a dog that had eaten something poisoned. They meet a talking bluebird named Beatrice. They run into a creepy woodsman living in an abandoned homestead, whose niche hobbies include chopping oilwood trees to keep his lantern lit. He tells them there's a beast prowling in the woods, so there's also that. Greg seems to take all of these strange happenings in stride. Wirt, on the other hand, is thoroughly weirded out by the fact that animals can suddenly talk or that magical beasts actually exist. And this is where we start to get a glimpse of who Wirt and Greg are and where they might have come from. Because the only reason Wirt would be so taken aback is if he comes from worlds like ours, where beasts and talking birds would definitely raise some eyebrows, or alternatively send people screaming and running for the hills. 
Over the Garden Wall has a pretty short runtime, with each of the 10 episodes under 11 minutes long. Not a single second of runtime is wasted here. Every single shot has a purpose, even if it's just there to set the tone. And as the boys venture deeper into this strange autumnal world, the larger story begins to unfold. Beatrice the Bluebird offers to take them to some woman named Adelaide of the Pasture, who can help take them home. Which Greg enthusiastically agrees to, but Wirt takes a little more convincing. And so what follows is the boys and Beatrice making this journey through the woods to get to Adelaide, running into all sorts of strange people, creatures, and places along the way. The genius of the writing here is that certain truths are only revealed gradually. We're seeing the unknown through the eyes of our heroes, and we only find things out as fast as they do. I really love this style of storytelling because it avoids info dumping and long-winded exposition, and instead focuses on the arc of the characters as they interact with their world. Like, there's definitely a lot going on here in the unknown, like much to unpack here, but you never once feel overwhelmed with any of it. It also adds a healthy layer of mystery and intrigue to the story. The lore is preserved because just enough, but not all, is explained to the viewer. And the true lore of Over the Garden Wall is, nothing is as it seems. The truth could be a lie, and lies are the truths we try to tell ourselves much to think about. In the second episode, the boys and Beatrice come across a town, because at this point, Wirt is still under the impression that talking bluebirds are not trustworthy guides, presumably because, again, he comes from a place where animals are typically not expected to be able to talk. They find this beautiful, pastoral little village. Surely there are nice, normal people around who they can ask for some directions. <laughs> These people are all wearing vegetable costumes and celebrating their harvest, and although they seem nice enough, you definitely get the sense that something's amiss. One does not simply pass through here. Our heroes get told off for trespassing and are severely punished for their crimes. I sentence you to a few hours of manual labor. Wait, what? Really? That's it? They're made to dig some holes in a field, and that's when we find out what these people are really about. Fun fact about this episode, the town is called Pottsfield, which is a reference to a potter's field, where the poor and unfortunate were buried in mass unmarked graves in the days of yore. So everyone here is a reanimated skeleton. So that's fun. And again, judging from Wirt's reaction, sentient skeletons are also not on his list of normal, acceptable things. Which then begs the question, where are they, really? Because it seems like they've found themselves in a different dimension entirely. But probably a better question than where are they is when are they? A lot of the places and people our characters come across seem to be rooted in a very specific time period, which looks like somewhere between the 18th and early 20th centuries. For example, the pumpkin people and the landscape of Pottsfield were inspired by vintage Halloween postcards from the early 1900s, which somehow capture the pastoral feel of that bygone era, while at the same time infusing it with a sense of eeriness and unease. Like, it just feels a little unsettling to be there, you know? In the third episode, Word has begrudgingly accepted Beatrice's offer to take him and Greg to Adelaide. And along the way, they come across a school that teaches animals how to behave like humans. The teacher is a young woman whose hairstyle and clothing places her somewhere in the Edwardian era. Her name is Miss Langtree, and I love the layers to her specifically. She wanted to teach animals to express themselves through reading and writing and music. You know very human things, all while lamenting the fact that her man ran off on her, only to later find out that he was the gorilla who's been terrorizing these here parts. All because he joined the circus to get enough money to be able to propose to her and got stuck in the gorilla costume, but he always meant to come back and become her husband. It's the little things in this show, the nuance. Miss Langtree wants to bring out the humanity in these animals, not realizing that the large animal who was wandering around was actually just a lost human stuck inside. Her man was with her all along, nothing's as it seems. In another episode, we come across a tavern full of people who look like they're from around the time of the American Revolution. I love this episode because of the little nod to Lord of the Rings here. It's the middle of the night and we're in friends come across a tavern in the rain and there's a little sign with an upside down horse on it, which to me felt like a reference to Frodo and friends arriving at the prancing pony in the middle of the night in the rain. And Elijah Wood played both Frodo and Wirt. 
So yeah, this, this broke my brain a little in the best way. I just love when great art draws inspiration from other great art. It's always so much fun to spot these Easter eggs. Anyway, our heroes later find themselves in a mansion because they're pretending to be this British guy's nephews so that they can swindle him for money and make it to Adelaide's. His name is Quincy Endicott and he's convinced that he's going mad, but not because he suddenly has nephews that came out of nowhere or that they've brought a talking horse with them. I want to steal. No, it's because he thinks there's a ghost somewhere in his infinitely large mansion, which, as Wirt points out, leads very Georgian in aesthetic taste. So why does he have rooms in the French Rococo style? Hmm, suspicious. It's revealed that Quincy's mansion is so huge that it borders another equally huge mansion, belonging to a French lady who is also his business competitor. Their mansions are so funny, they're like these tiny universes, just expanding on and on forever until the end of time. So as the story unfolds, we start to see that all the people Wirt and Greg meet are from periods lost to history. But since there are so many different historical eras represented in these characters, the unknown starts to look like a place that exists out of time. In a span of just a few episodes, the assumption that Wirt and Greg are just lost in a creepy forest has morphed into the unsettling feeling that they're just no longer tethered to reality at all. Nothing is indeed as it seems. So much of Over the Garden Wall is presented one way on the surface, but upon a closer look, things turn out quite differently. I love this particular genre of fantasy, by the way. The stories where the characters are from the supposed real world, but somehow find themselves lost in a completely different one. And the journey to return home becomes the catalyst for their own inner transformation transformation. From zero to hero, the new world with its new rules reveals who these characters really are. And bonus points if the veil between the two worlds isn't super clear. Like if there's no obvious door or wardrobe to walk into to cross into the next dimension. Rather, it's like the two worlds are superimposed on each other in very specific places and the characters just happen to be in the right place at the right time. Spirited Away is probably the best example of this. Chihiro wanders into what she thinks is an abandoned theme park and suddenly finds herself in a whole other world where no one looks or acts like her where strange creatures lurk in the shadows. Like Wirt and Greg, the reality she knew melted away into something completely abstract and unfamiliar. And the only way she could get home was go through a transformation herself. Her surroundings changed and she had to change with it in order to survive. By the way, Over the Garden Wall actually does pay a small homage to Spirited Away as well. In one episode, the brothers come across a girl who is seemingly being kept as her aunt's indentured servant. Sound familiar? And the brothers are told that if they stay around, they'll be devoured. To the audience, it seems like Auntie Whispers is going to be the one doing the devouring, but no, it's the girl. She's been possessed by a demon, which can only be controlled with a magic bell. The boys free the girl, whose name is Lorna, from demon possession, and the aunt, who actually turns out to be a nice, normal lady, well, mostly normal at least, she warns them of her evil sister Adelaide, who lives out in the pasture. Which I think was a really nice callback to the sisters Yubaba and Zaniba, especially given Auntie Whispers' art style. Just an overly large woman with eyes the size of dinner plates. In every great story, there's a pair of twin witches. This is the way. So yes, Adelaide, who Beatrice the Bluebird was leading the boys to, is evil. Because Beatrice was once human, and her family was once human, and it was her fault that they were cursed to be bluebirds. And because Beatrice wants to be human again, she struck a deal with the witch called Adelaide. And her job was to deliver children to Adelaide so that she can stuff their heads with wool and turn them into her servants to do her every bidding. Side note, I love that everyone in this world needs domestic help, apparently. Pottsfield needs landscapers. Quincy Endicott needs an honest cart horse who won't steal. I've got a real job now as an official tea horse. This dusty witch needs a house cleaner. I don't know, have they tried putting out help wanted signs or something? Because I feel like waiting eons for random children or horses to pass by will lead to significant labor shortages. But here's the thing about Beatrice. She didn't start out this journey caring about the children she was supposed to deliver to Adelaide, but she did in the end. She wasn't immune to Wirt's awkward charms or the way he recites poetry in response to stressful situations. She wasn't immune to Greg's endearing songs. Oh, potatoes and molasses. Or the sweet way he was able to connect to literally every person and creature they ran into. Beatrice decided she wanted to become human again, but not at the cost of Wirt and Greg's lives. So Beatrice kills Adelaide, which is honestly so iconic of her. This is why I love animation so much. 
because death by Bluebird feels like a plausible thing that can happen. Unfortunately for Beatrice though, Word has already witnessed her treachery and runs off with Greg and his trust in her is completely broken. There's a running theme throughout the show of owning up to your actions and establishing a real sense of self. But the only way to do that is to be your real self. And each of our heroes is revealed to be acting or hiding a part of themselves at some level, in some way. Beatrice lied about Adelaide being a kind, benevolent old woman. Wirt and Greg's clothes are actually Halloween costumes. Let's talk about Wirt and Greg here for a second. When first watching this, it's not immediately clear why Wirt is wearing a cape and a cone on his head, nor why Greg is wearing a teapot and carrying a limitless supply of candy in his pants. But towards the end, we do get our answer. Wirt and Greg are actually from the modern world our world, and it's Halloween night, so everyone is wearing costumes. Wirt is a garden gnome, Greg is an elephant, and the teapot spout is his little trunk. By the way, if I wasn't clear before, I want to adopt Greg. Like That is an actual baby child who must be protected at all costs. Wirt, as we saw before, is a nervous wreck because he's into music and poetry, and he's also into this girl named Sarah. So he made her a mixtape, and he wanted to give it to her on Halloween night. But he chickens out at the last minute because he's afraid of being perceived. Which, real. But luckily for him, he has a younger brother who hasn't hit puberty yet, and therefore is immune to feelings of embarrassment. And Greg cheerfully offers to give the tape to Sarah. This is where we really start to see the tension between Wirt and Greg that we've been seeing throughout the series. Wirt clearly didn't ask for his mom to remarry and have another kid, but here he is. Greg, meanwhile, thinks Wirt is the coolest thing to exist on planet Earth, other than pet rocks and giving frogs every name under the sun. And Greg wants to hang out with his bro and make him happy. So of course he'll give Sarah the tape. It's so funny, the difference between the two brothers, the way Wirt overthinks literally every interaction he has with these other kids. Like he's losing his mind at the thought of showing up uninvited to this party and what everyone will think of him and, and everyone's actually just like, oh, hey Wirt, how's it going? So safe to say Wirt is anxiety personified. And yet beneath it all, there is still bravery within him because he did make a mixtape and he did intend to give it to the girl that he likes. That bravery manifests later when he realizes what a prick he's been to Greg all along and when he realizes that he's let the beast take Greg away. Let's talk about who Greg really is. On the surface, he's this whimsical little child who wants to make the world a better place, but he eventually learns that sometimes you have to accept what's real in order to make a change. There's one episode where he dreams he's been taken to a cloud city where the art style is very reminiscent of early cartoons. By the way, Jenna Ortega is one of the voices of the Cloud City Reception Committee, so we can add over the garden wall to her very impressive spooky season resume. I think the stylistic choice serves both to inform us of Greg's inner world while also symbolically transitioning Greg from a naive little kid to someone who takes responsibility. And in this case, Greg offers himself to the beast so that Wirt can be spared and so that they can go home. But the reality is that they are truly lost and it was all Greg's fault and Greg decides that he should be the one to fix it. But it wasn't all Greg's fault. Not really. Which Wirt realizes when he wakes up and sees that Greg is gone. The true lore behind how they got themselves into the unknown is that they jumped literally over a garden wall. They were goofing off in a graveyard on Halloween night, got caught by the police, and ran away. Because being in a graveyard on Halloween night is illegal in this world, apparently. That feels disingenuous if it is. We used to be a proper country. We used to go to graveyards and bang pots and pans on Hall Hallows Eve to wake up our sleeping brethren. In all the chaos, Wirt and Greg hurl themselves over a wall and tumble into a valley where they're almost killed by an oncoming train before falling into a river. They've had a day, let's just say that. Also, fun fact, if you listen to the opening song closely, you can hear the sound of a train whistling in the background. And this is where that sense of liminality, which has been present throughout the show, really comes into the foreground. That feeling of neither being here nor there. Because the last thing we see from this flashback are the brothers sinking down into the river before everything fades to black. And when Wirt wakes up, he's surrounded by Beatrice's family, and he decides to take responsibility too. He chooses to go save Greg. 
he chooses to be brave. He makes up with Beatrice and together they go to rescue Greg from the beast's clutches, even though Wirt is still lost and Beatrice still has no way of undoing her bluebird curse. None of those unknowns matter to them in this moment. Right now, all they care about is saving that little boy. I want to point out the beast's role here. He's honestly not in the show all that much and mostly lurks in the background, but he is a direct foil to Wirt in particular. The beast has been tricking the woodsman all this time, making him think that he needed to chop trees in order to keep his lantern lit, which the beast claimed was housing the soul of the woodsman's lost daughter. But as we can all guess by now, nothing is as it seems. Wirt realizes that it's the beast's soul that's been in the lantern the entire time, and he's been stealing the souls of lost people and turning them into trees to keep himself alive. The beast is a creature that feared death, which is its own kind of unknown. Similarly, Wirt was afraid of messing up or doing things outside his comfort zone, like talking to his crush and sharing his music with her. But unlike the beast, Wirt chose to face his fears in the end. He chose to face his own unknown. He faced the fact that he did mess up, especially at being a good older brother to Greg. But he decided to do something about that, and that made all the difference. Wirt hands the lantern over to the woodsman so that he can do the honor of snuffing out the beast's soul, and he takes his brother home. And as the woodsman contemplates this, you can actually see the shape of the beast in the lantern's flame. Whereas before, the flame was shaped like a girl. But as we now know, that was just another one of the beast's lies. Just the details in the show go absolutely crazy. They had no business cooking up a cartoon with this much gas, but here we are. Word asked Beatrice to come with them, but she must stay because there's one mistake she hasn't owned up to yet, which is admitting to her family that it's her fault that they were all cursed to be bluebirds. But as luck would have it, Word came through in the end for Beatrice too. He reveals that he stole Adelaide's magic scissors which he hands over to Beatrice so that she can turn back into a human. And then they say their goodbyes. It's very earned, it's very poignant, and it's... You just know that they'll always remember this wild ride they had together, even when they're back in their own separate worlds again. But let's go back to the original question, shall we? What and where is the unknown? The very next scene we see after Wirt and Greg say goodbye to Beatrice is them being pulled out of the river we saw them drowning in. Neither of them are really conscious and they're taken to a hospital. Smells to me like it was all just a grand hallucination, induced by nearly dying via oncoming train. So was it all just a dream? Well, what I love so much is that we are given zero exposition about what the unknown is, but we are shown everything. The fact that Wirt and Greg both wake up remembering all of their adventures, which wouldn't have been the case if it had just been a dream because two people can't have the same dream, unless they're wizards or otherwise have psychic powers of some sort. But Wirt is a teenage boy dressed as a garden gnome and is a poetry nerd in his spare time, so I really think that's out the window. The only indication we get that the unknown is an actual place is that magic bell in the frog's tummy, which he ate when they met Auntie Whispers. So what really is the unknown? Well, let's look at the characters. By the end, the brothers have healed their relationship with each other, Word isn't embarrassed to have Greg as a sibling anymore, and he also isn't afraid to admit to Sarah that he likes her and that he made her a mixtape. Well, not totally unafraid. Maybe, maybe, we, maybe we should listen to some other tapes first, though, and sort of work our way to this one. This one's a little- Greg has finally found a fitting name for his frog. And as for the others elsewhere, the woodsman is home and reunites with his daughter, who is alive again. Miss Langtree lives happily ever after with her man, Auntie Whispers and Lorna are living their best lives, and we see what happened to Beatrice. She's with her family again, and they are no longer bluebirds. I love that her color palette is still vaguely reminiscent of a bluebird though, with her red hair and blue dress. And from the looks of it, she is a Regency era girly. They even gave her the classic curly updo, and her dress has an empire waist. She looks like she just sprung out of a Jane Austen book, and I love it so much. She's also back in her home, which if you look carefully, is the same abandoned house we saw the woodsman squatting in in the very first episode. In all of these little character vignettes, it's clear that everyone has moved on to bigger and better things. We also see that it's no longer autumn wherever they are. It's actually started to snow. 
Some people have suggested that the unknown is a kind of afterlife or purgatory and that everyone in it is already dead. This was hinted at when the residents of Pottsfield told Wirt and Greg that they were too early to be there and the fact that they're all resurrected skeletons. There's also a gravestone in Wirt and Greg's world with the name Quincy Endicott on it, presumably where the dead body of this Quincy Endicott is buried, which I think is so incredible because he really is living the life after he's dead with his tea empire and mansion the size of the universe and having Marie Antoinette for a girlfriend. But to me personally, the unknown seems to be a little more nuanced than just an afterlife. To me, it's a kind of crossroads, linking all of these lives together from various places in history. It's an in-between place where beings who have unfinished business go to work out their problems. It's a place where transformation can happen. But whether these guys actually get to work things out is up to them. Owning up to themselves and taking responsibility is a choice they still have to make as we saw with our main heroes. And once they do make that choice, the unknown transforms just like all the characters do. The world shifts from autumn to winter, signaling that spring and even the joys of high summer will happen one day. And those in the unknown who strive to make a change get to move on to whatever is the next great adventure, whether that's life or the afterlife. By showing us that the magic bell is still with Wirt and Greg even after the wake up in the real world, we see that two things can be true. The unknown is the state of mind, but it's also a real tangible place. The magic bell scene here is yet another little nod to Spirited Away, specifically the ending where you aren't sure whether Chihiro's adventures in the spirit world were real or just a dream. But then we see the purple hair tie that Zaniba gave her glinting in the sun. And that's all you really need to know that it didn't all just happen in her head. Stories that explore these kinds of liminal spaces are truly something special because they are so subjective to the individual. Your experience of these worlds and whether they become real or not is entirely your decision, just like all of life is. And I think that's pretty neat. Guys, thank you so much for watching me ramble somewhat incoherently about the show, but it truly is a masterpiece and deserves a yap session from me. I've seen so many people write it off as just a fun little cartoon, which it is, but also it's one of the most important pieces of spooky season media that we've gotten in the last decade. I'm dead serious. Shows of this quality really do come out only once in a millennium, animated or otherwise, and I think we as a society need more of them. If you somehow haven't seen it by now, first of all, congrats. I don't know how you scroll the internet every October and not see copious amounts of over the garden wall tributes. But if you haven't, I hope I've convinced you guys to give it a watch. As I mentioned earlier in this video, it's the 10th anniversary of this show existing in the world and creator Patrick McHale has announced that they're releasing a stop motion animated short to celebrate. I think it comes out like November 2nd, if I'm not mistaken. So y'all know I'll be seated for that. I hope you guys have a great spooky season wherever you are. Even if you're in sunny Australia and your Tim Tams are melting in their wrappers. I'm so sorry. I don't know why I keep bringing up Australia at this time. I got my flu shot and COVID shot in the same arm. And I think I'm just losing my mind to delirium. It's starting to hit me. It's, it's starting to hit me. I myself will probably start slipping into the unknown at, at some point today. I'm sure of it. Anyway, that's enough antics. Um, I hope you guys take care and I'll see y'all on my next video. Bye.